Mr. Miscavige presides over meetings like this internationally that include members of the church from many different persuasions, from many different languages, from many different churches. So it is crystal clear, Your Honor, what's going on here. This is a simple case of an invasion of privacy by a woman who feels like she was abused. Okay, I get that. I get that. If someone if someone has done her harm, she's entitled to recognize. She's entitled to make her case. She's entitled to demonstrate to and, and get recovery from those who violated her rights if they did. That's not Mr. Scavenger. That's not the, he's not the one who's behind this, and they've got the person who is behind this. They've got, they, they, they sued an, an entity that they say is responsible directly for all of the conduct that she supposedly suffered. Let them prove that that entity is responsible. If, they, if they're successful in their proof, that entity will have to answer for all of its activities, not Mr. Miscavige, and not the, the, the RTC, the Religious Technology Center. Just on a so we have a special appearance that is that is pending. I want to just outline for the court how this I believe how the court ought to uh, analyze and decide whether the special appearance is good. The result of the special <coughs> appearance, if we're successful, would be the dismissal of Mr. Miscavige, the dismissal of the RTC from this lawsuit because they don't have sufficient contacts with the state. We have affidavit testimony. We'll offer uh, testimony from the stand that they have no sufficient contact for the state so that this court could exercise jurisdiction over them. So they should be dismissed. That will not mean Ms. Rathman doesn't have a remedy. She'll have a remedy. But that's not why, that's not why, thanks for, why, the, only, the reason why the plaintiffs sued these individuals is because they believe, they understand that this is something that the church cares violently about, cares mightily about, that is preserving its ecclesiastical independence, preserving its ability to govern itself. So they, they filed their original petition, original petition stated no jurisdictional facts. They simply named Mr. Miscavige as a defendant, they named the RTC as a defendant, and they cited this private investigation activity, and, and, and that was it. They didn't even suggest how these parties, how these activities were tied together. We filed a special appearance. At that point, they filed their amended petition, and in their amended petition, they claim a bunch of things that have nothing to do with whether Mr. Miscavige and the RTC has a connection to the activities in Texas. Again, the only fact that they can rely on are facts that happened 2004 and before. So they're not bringing forth any evidence, any direct evidence that Anything that's happening to Ms. Rathman has anything to do with Mr. Miscavige. And in fact, it does not. Mr. Miscavige is busy on other things. He doesn't know Marty Rathman. He, he doesn't care about Marty Rathman. He's opening churches around the world for the faithful who are part of the Church of Scientology. They allege now that somehow Mr. Miscavige must be the one who said, go and surveil Ms. Rathman. That Mr. Miscavige himself said, go and surveil Ms. Rathman to, I, I presume, to the private investigators who did it. Even if that were true, which it is not, even if that were true, the case law is absolutely clear that that would be insufficient to support jurisdiction against Mr. Miscavige. And how do we know that? Because the Texas Supreme Court not two weeks ago, handed down the Moncrief Oil versus 080 gas from uh, marketing case, where they said, a non-resident directing a tort at Texas from afar is insufficient to confer specific jurisdiction. So even if the plaintiff is correct, that Mr. Miscavige sat behind his desk and said, go get Ms. Ms. Grafton and surveil her, that, according to the Texas Supreme Court, would be insufficient to support jurisdiction in Texas. That is their best case of jurisdiction in Texas, and those facts are indisputably not true. 
Mr. Miscavige has submitted an affidavit from the, uh, a personal affidavit attesting to the fact that he doesn't know these investigators and he had nothing to do with this supposed surveillance. So, Your Honor, when we get there, and I know we have some things we have to argue about as we, as we proceed through, through the, 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 the pending motions, and, and one of those things is going to be a motion that they'll have to get additional discovery, and we'll argue thoroughly about whether they're entitled to discovery under these facts. Our contention is that they're not entitled to discovery at all, that they're pleading ties them to their jurisdictional facts, and, and that even if you accept everything they say in the pleading is true, there's still not sufficient jurisdiction to support uh, personal jurisdiction under, on a constitutional basis. Um, at that point, we'll get to the merits of the special appearance. Uh, with this background, hopefully the court will have a better uh, appreciation for at least the arguments on both sides. Um, and at the end of that, we will ask that Mr. Miscavige and the RTC be dismissed from the city for lack of jurisdiction. Thank you. Um, I'll kind of go forward um, in light of what I've already expressed uh, with regard to my concern with the disqualification motion and related confidential and privileged information. Um, and it's it, generally my understanding uh, that perhaps what the idea here is, and it seems to be a good one, that we begin the temporary injunction hearing uh, to a degree that if it's recessed, we can then move forward with a restraining order in place. I, I think that's the gist of what I've heard in a lot of quick conversations after this conference. Um, I might submit to the court because I'm not exactly sure how to address some of the issues that Mr. Jeffrey raised with regard to what I believe to be confidential and privileged information in my opening. Um, uh, with regard to the injunction issues, there's been a lot of back and forth, and I think the majority of what we've talked about here this morning has been on special appearance and jurisdiction issues. But there were some things addressed that I would need to address on the injunction. Um, what I might submit to the court is that uh, Ms. Rathman has submitted an affidavit in support of the temporary restraining order in the original petition <coughs> that is offered, I think, in support of the injunction relief. We would agree to the entry of that affidavit as the testimony required at this particular point in order to ripen the hearing, if you will, so that we can move forward. I don't have to open any further, nor do we have to hear from Ms. Rathbun any potential confidential information, nor do we have to cross her on it somehow. Uh, and, and I, I appreciate the offer. I'm not sure that I can dictate that necessarily or that they, both everybody would have to agree. My point is that I did restrict Mr. Jeffries in the offer of any testimony to current matters. So we're not going back to 2004 or anything of the sort today at, at all. My, I'm, I'm not sure I can force him to agree to submit submitting that act as, as his evidence. Okay. Um, I want to address the council per se, uh, but well, Your Honor, ask him if, if, I may, if I may help. Uh, it, there's two parts to this I'm case. Okay with it personally, if that's the way we want to go. There, there's two parts to this case. There's the Texas part that we've sued for, and then there's our burden, as you've already heard. They claim we can't do it of showing who's responsible for all this stuff. That's the part they have concerns about. Who's responsible for it behind the scenes? Mrs. Rathbun's testimony will not touch on that, but it will have uh, uh, plenty of relevant evidence for the court to consider that she actually knows about that happened here in Texas. So we're not getting into that stuff. And no, we, we don't agree to use her affidavit. Generally speaking, affidavits are not competent evidence in an injunction here, and we don't agree. But I, I mean, outside of agreement to the contrary. Right. And, and my proposal would be to submit the affidavit to ripen this hearing so that it can be recessed for the injunction of temporary restraining suspension. Uh, I wouldn't be asking that he would not, in addition to the affidavit submitted, be able to put uh, 
Ms. Rathburn on for full direct examination when we read uh, That would be part of my talk process. Yeah, part, part of the delay between the last time we consulted in the chambers and me getting to the bench was just simply trying to look at the calendar and the calendar is difficult. Uh, so uh, I'm probably going to be willing to receive a certain amount of testimony, but I do want it ultimately to be restricted to the issues at hand regarding the, the, the alleged injury, the harm, and why it's susceptible of injunctive relief. So, and all the other issues to the extent it ultimately is dealt with, that will be a later time. Okay, thank you. Yes. Um, just very quickly again for the court reporter, I'm Les Street with Davis Deal and Mendoza, I represent CSI. Uh, and I'm going to try and kind of weave through what I've objected about, and then Mr. Jefferson covered some of the waterfront, uh, also a general background about the church and things like that. Uh, so I'll try to be as brief as I can. Um, when I was here, I guess it was a couple of weeks ago, uh, uh, one of the things and, and the one one of the difficulties I was having is I had just been retained. My firm had just been retained. And I've spent the past couple of weeks kind of trying to get my mind around an understanding of the Church of Scientology and its religion. Uh, and the reason I'm going here is because it's extremely important to have that understanding. And as I've gained that knowledge uh, about the church, uh, it, it's helped me understand the, the request for injunctive relief and the rights of both parties uh, in this proceeding. I'll, I'll, I won't go into it any further. Mr. Jefferson did a good job. But the, the Church of Scientology is an, ex it, 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 it's an established religion. Talk about recognition before the United States Internal Revenue Service and the law. But, but from a more practical standpoint, uh, it, it, it's a uh, very well established religion and it's based upon the writings and teaching of, of L. Ron Hubbard. And I don't know if the court is familiar uh, with Mr. Hubbard uh, or his writing. Uh, kind of the preeminent writing is the book called Dianetics. Uh, and it sets out a lot of his teachings and, and a lot of his um, uh, thoughts uh, that are the basis for the Scientology religion. Uh, it currently uh, has churches in 150 different nations, uh, and it both produces written literature and, like everybody else, it's available online. I think last year, 19 million people have it, has visited their website. Uh, so it, it's all over the world, it's all over the United States, it's all 50 states, uh, and countries from Italy, to Russia, to everywhere else. Um, I think Mr. Jeffers said something about that this uh, is not a religious dispute, but Judge Edith Hart, it is. Um, uh, the plaintiff, Monique Rathbun, is the wife of, of uh, Marty Rathbun. And as Mr. Jeffers said, uh, he was with the church for about 20 years, and he had a very high office within the church. Uh, and uh, uh, there were circumstances in which he was asked to leave the church, uh, and, and that was about 10 years ago. Um, as Ms. Rathburn states in her affidavit, and, and this is very important for uh, injunctive mm -hmm. issues, uh, and, and directly with respect to the issue of whether or not there's been a harm. Um, in her affidavit, 